Why are you looking among the dead? Yeshua is risen, just as he said. Go quickly and tell it to Peter and John. The sepulchre's empty, the body is gone. again as he did before. Alive is he always forevermore. Yeshua is risen just as he said. Look not for the living among the Welcome to the Pentwater Bible Church. We're glad that you could join us today, and I'm Daniel Woodhead. I'm the pastor, and uh, I'm just happy to bring this message to you today on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we've been calling it Easter for a long time, and I don't have any problem with that either. I know it's a pagan name, but it's not what we're celebrating, any pagan, any pagan entity. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Now, since we are meeting uh, online for just a short while, a couple more weeks maybe, a few, I'm not sure, um, I've kind of condensed things uh, today from what we would do maybe on a Monday, Thursday to talk about his uh, suffering and, and, uh, and then his, um, that is a, a, another discussion, you know, on Good Friday. But I've kind of put these together today, so we have a rather lengthy message today, and I'm hopeful that you can appreciate what the biblical text has to say about Jesus fulfilling so much of the law. And we're going to look at how he fulfilled the festivals, particularly Pesach, Pesach, it's the Hebrew term there for Passover. So we're blessed that you could join us today. Um, I do have a few announcements that I'd like to uh, offer to you today, and that is uh, we continue to pray for our nation and our nation's leaders as we are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. Um, I know there's lots of data that suggests it's not so big, it's, it, and then other data suggests it is very big, and there's all kinds of reports. This is not terrible. For the Christian, we are not being compromised. We're told to obey the government unless the government tells us not to obey the Lord Jesus. So I don't see that happening here. And uh, other 
folks from the seminary that and, and that I've been in conference with they see it the same way. So let's just obey the government. Let's see if we can't wipe out this pandemic by our behavior, if you will, and let the officials attack it and go after some uh, medication and so on that will have efficacy. So I do ask for prayer for Mary Beth and as her uh, her husband passed here, well, it's about six, seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago almost, my goodness. And uh, I just ask for prayer for Mary Beth as she continues uh, to move forward without her husband, her beloved husband, Harry, and our cherished member. And uh, as she uh, is in widowhood and uh, going through the grieving process, it does take a while to move through that. And uh, we're blessed that she's with us. I know she's with us online today. I ask for prayer, continued prayer for Jonathan as he continues his healing from brain surgery. And uh, we're, we're hopeful that uh, he's going to be fully restored and he won't have the problems that he had before with that. Always, as we pray here in our announcements and ask for prayer, of course, we ask for prayer for Dr. Todd Baker and Dave James, our missionaries. And we're hopeful that uh, as soon as the restrictions are lifted, that they'll be back out in the field uh, giving the good news of the gospel to those that are thirsting for it, even if they don't know that they're thirsting for it. They all have been given a desire for God, and many people just replace it with other things until they find the Lord, and the Lord comes into their life. So we pray for our missionaries, and uh, we pray for their success after they get back out in the field. And we pray also that they don't get too frustrated waiting for this to end. And... Uh, and we pray for their comfort as well. Always we ask prayer for our children. Uh, if you train a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. The scriptures tell us that unequivocally, and we ask for prayer for our children and our grandchildren as well. So many people have silent prayer requests, and folks, we pray that those that do have silent prayer requests will be answered because many people are just uncomfortable with voicing their concerns because they're in some sense situations. They're just embarrassing to them, and we understand that. So we, we pray and ask for prayer for that as well. We always ask for prayer for the Mideast and the vulnerability right now of Israel to uh, the rapid spread of this coronavirus, especially on Passover, where uh, they're not able to get out and get to their synagogues and so on. Um, there is a quarantine there, and there is a uh, time when they're all supposed to be staying in their homes, and they've been given curfews. It starts at 3 o'clock on uh, Israeli time. I ask for prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. Sha'alu shalom, Yerushalayim. And uh, just as a side note, uh, if any of you would care to have Dr. Baker's newsletter, which he offers, um, just uh, make a note here on uh, Facebook or send us an email and uh, at uh, info, uh, well, excuse me, let's at Pentwater Bible Church at schofieldinstitute.org. Pentwater Bible Church at schofieldinstitute.org. And we'll be happy to convey that to him so that he can get his newsletter out to you. It's got great information in it, and he's got some pretty good authors, very good, I should say, uh, that write articles, including Dr. Baker. So uh, let's uh, see if you could uh, if you could get that. Um, we'll resume next week our uh, study of the book of Isaiah, and we're in the little apocalypse uh, there, those four chapters, and we'll be in uh, again in chapter 27, but this will be session 14, uh, 13, excuse me, 13, session 13 that we'll be in. So with that, um, I'm going to pray for us, and uh, you could just bow your heads and pray with me. I would appreciate it. Father, we are so blessed to know you, and we hold up in prayer all of our elected officials. Lord, we just ask that you would fill them with your spirit, those that know you, and convict those that don't know you, that they would respond to your leading 
and take the appropriate measures that you would have us do to combat this virus that is spread around the world. Father, you, I know, will do your part, and Father, we pray that they will do their part. Make them want to believe you, Father, and make them want to follow you so that we can end this virus sooner than later, and they can conduct godly leadership in the activities that they pursue for our country and this world as well, Lord. And we always remember the nation Israel. As I prayed, Sha'alu Shalom, Yerushalayim, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Father. Lord, we pray for our missionaries, Todd Baker, Dave James. We pray that uh, you would continue to hold them up, give them success when they get back out in the field. And Lord, take away their frustration as they are waiting to get out and wondering when this will be over. Lord, we pray for Mary Beth and her comfort at this time as she moves through this grieving process. And we pray for Jonathan, Father, as he moves through this physical healing process of uh, the brain surgeries that he's had, the multiple brain surgeries that he's had. We pray for our children, Lord. We pray for our grandchildren. We pray, that, Lord, that they would come to know you in a full and meaningful way and want you in their lives, Lord, in all of their behavior and activities. We pray for their parents, Father, and their grandparents, that those people would lead them in the way that they should go. And we thank you for what they're doing already, Lord. Lord, we hold up our silent prayer request, folks, and uh, we don't know what they are. We don't know what their needs are, Lord. You do. Your Spirit knows, Lord, our Holy Spirit. He knows. And we pray, Lord, that you will reach them with their needs and comfort them and let them, as they silently pray to you, be aware of your intervention to provide them their request according to what you would have them do. Father, we're so blessed to know you. We're so blessed. We're so blessed to pray for the Mideast. We're so blessed to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. And we are just so blessed to know you, Father. It is such it is such an honor and it's such a comfort to know, Lord, that our confession of faith in you and your gospel and the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus will take us to paradise on the other side when that time comes. And thank you, Father, as we ask you again to bless this time today as we honor you and celebrate you, our Lord Jesus, from rising from the dead, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, I would uh, ask that we sing our first tune now. We're going to sing The Old Rugged Cross.
Well, shall we uh, bow our heads and ask the Lord to lead us in this communion today as we celebrate his death and resurrection? Father, hold us up, Lord, as we begin to recognize you as we do every week, Lord, with our communion. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Thank you, Father. The night before the Lord Jesus died, he gathered his apostles in the upper room, and they were celebrating the last Passover meal. Now, Passover is the first holiday of the seven in the Jewish year. Now, modern Jews have added a couple more uh, to those holidays, <clears throat> but the biblical holidays that they celebrate are Passover, the first one, and we'll look at the rest of them as we get into our message in a few moments. Those holidays are important because they're all tied to the Lord Jesus, and God gave them these holidays. The Passover meal at that time was a large event, and they had multiple courses, they had wine, they had celebration, and what they were celebrating was the Lord releasing them from Pharaoh's um, holding them in about 1445 B.C. Now, they had gone down to Egypt 400 years before then as a family of 70, and now there was almost 2 million of them, and they would be released to come out of Egypt because of the Passover. So this Passover was a massive celebration that these apostles and the Lord Jesus were celebrating in the upper room. And Jesus was looking at them, and he took a towel and he wrapped it around his waist, and he bent down and he started to wash their feet. And they were just appalled that the master would be doing this. And he was telling them they had to be the servant of all. They were going to be true leaders. They had to be the servant of all. And he washed their feet, instructing them about humility, caring for others, and having an attitude, the right attitude, to carry out their ministry. He then began to talk to them about the death that he would undergo, and they didn't want him to die either, which uh, would have been Satan's plan had he been able to keep Jesus from going to the cross. But Jesus was going to go to the cross because Jesus is God in the flesh. And what the Lord Jesus did was he finished that Passover meal and he implemented the first communion. And we're commanded to keep this communion, to remember him until he comes again. And he will return. He's promised. So this communion process we have is symbolic for one, the beating that his body took, and two, the blood that flowed from his veins from both the Roman lictors that scourged him and the 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 actual blood that fell so you got the beating and you got the blood that came from the roman scourging and the uh, painful process of driving those nails into his wrist and his feet as he hung on that cross so we are blessed to know these things but why did he do this because this is the way god has chosen to eliminate the charge of sin in individuals on this earth. So if you believe this historic event that Jesus died and rose from the dead, God enters you and takes up residence in you, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Illuminator, the Great Teacher, and stays with you, does not leave you ever seals you and you are on your way to heaven you can't lose your salvation any more than you can 
uh, earn your salvation. And people will teach things such as this occasionally, but it's not true, folks. You can't lose your salvation because God gave it to you. God is the one who orchestrated it, and he doesn't take it away for anything that you've done. He didn't give it to you for anything that you've done. All you've done is just say, I believe in this historic event. God loves you and wants you to be in heaven with him, and he offers this to the world. Now, what did Jesus do then? Well, he took bread, he broke it, and he passed it around, and he said to those men, this is my body which is broken for you. Take this and eat it. And in a like manner, to represent the blood that would flow from his veins, again, through the beating that the lictors gave him with these scourges and, and then the uh, nailing to the cross, he poured wine into a cup. And he held that up and he said to those men, This is my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we, who are able to be on this side of the cross, are most blessed to know these things. We have this blessed assurance he's coming again. And we have the assurance of our salvation because God has told us he's given us this salvation. God bless. Well, let's sing our next tune. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Uh, shall we pray? Father, we love you and we thank you and we just pray that you would teach us all things as you promised. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Let us hear what you would have us learn today. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, in this time, we are going to be looking at how Jesus fulfilled a number of aspects of the Old Testament. What did he do? How is this important to us? What does it mean? And why should we study these things? To say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that he died for us, is very important, but it's so fulfilling to understand what exactly he did so that we have this assurance that he is the one 
And I'm going to start by looking at the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. And we have a throne room scene in chapter 5 where there's this, this terrible situation going on where, where the people in the throne room, and we've got the, we've got the elders that have been raptured from the church, seraphim, angels, cherubim, God the Father, and um, there's this scroll that they have. And God the Father has in his right hand, the text reads in Revelation 5, 1, where John says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back, closed seals with seven seals. Now the book is a scroll, because they didn't have leaves like we have, folios. God the Father's got this book in his right hand. It's written on both sides, and there's seven seals. Now it's rolled up, and as it unrolls, there's a seal, and it unrolls farther, and there's another seal. So they're not all along the edge of the rolling up here. The designation of book here is this scroll. Let's look at Revelation 5, 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a great voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now a strong angel now appears asking a key question regarding the eligibility. Who's going to open this book? Who can, who can unseal the seals? Who can get this open? This book is the title deed to the earth. We're beginning the tribulation here in the throne room of God, and he's orchestrating it, and he's going to be taking back the earth. Now, Revelation 5, 3 says, And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look thereon. So initially, everybody's in a quandary. Well, who can open it? They knew it had to be opened. God the Father's got it in his hand. The three realms identified here are heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. But look what they do now. They're all getting into a panic. And this angel says in verse 4, And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look thereon. So the apostle John starts weeping because there's no one worthy. Uh, worthiness, as in the earlier chapter, chapter number four of the book of Revelation, implies deity worthy of our worship. Those falling short of this nature are in the three realms listed above. Heaven, you got the angelic, celestial beings, earth, humans, under the earth, demonic. None are worthy or have taken, have deity, have, 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 um, are, are just deified. They can't do it. Any of those three are not able to. It has to be God that takes back the law, that takes back the earth, that takes control of the whole earth. Now, one of the aspects of the law that Christ fulfilled are the festivals of the Lord. And look at the fifth chapter of Revelation, chapter 5. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath overcome to open the book and the seven seals thereof. We know that this designation of the line of the tribe of Judah is a reference to the Lord Jesus because at the end of the book of Genesis, you see Jacob on his deathbed, and he's giving each one of his 12 sons a prophecy about what they would become. And Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is, is determined at that point. We know that Judah overcame much, is now commanded, um, in retrospect, if you will, the Lord Jesus came through Judah. So Judah, back then, was given this prophecy 
that he was, it was like a command. He was going to bring forth a Messiah. And we look at this now that the person in, in, their per, in his person is the Lord Jesus that came through this line. He's physically a man, but he's spiritually a God. The God. Not a God, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> each one of the members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are God in their essence, but they have three different personalities. This is now the role that the Lord Jesus, getting the scroll to take the earth back, and he's going to conduct the tribulation from the throne room. Why has Jesus overcome? Why does he command it to do this? Why is he the only one that's worthy? The legal reason that he did this is because he fulfilled the law. The spiritual reason is because he is God, and this is what he has established as the way for people to overcome the sin nature that is here and enter heaven upon leaving these bodies. He prevailed, and he's now fully qualified. There's a number of ways of fulfilling the law. He fulfilled them all. And we have to look at the richness of God's word here that reveals a really deep truth, if you know where to look. And today we're going to look at the seven festivals that are found in Leviticus 23 and uh, strongly represent the coming of the Messiah and his return for redemption and the restoration of man and the earth back to God. Now there is a principle in the Bible that I refer to as the shadow principle. In other words, future events cast a shadow before them. Just like if somebody is standing and the sun is coming this way and he's standing, then the shadow behind him goes down like a pyramid and it gets increasingly smaller. Well, future events are like that. They will have some level of uh, intensity, and that gradually gets get bigger until the event happens. You can see this in the, the Olivet Discourse, talking about the footsteps of the Messiah, the events leading up to the Messianic Kingdom. Uh, this shadowing is brought out in several different spots. I'm going to look at Colossians 2 verses 16 to 17 where the text there reads let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ uh, meat is the old english term for food <laughs> hebrews 10 verses 1 to 10 for the law having a shadow of good things to come in, not the very image of the things that can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because uh, that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. So verses 1 to 2, excuse me, this is verse 1 to 2, um, of Hebrews tells us the Mosaic law offered a mere shadow or a likeness of what was to come through the Lord Jesus. Now there's direct access to God because the old law was not the final plan. It was never able to provide a final or, or a perfect cleansing from sin because if sacrifices could have made people perfect, wouldn't have had to repeat them year after year after year, Sabbath after Sabbath, and there would have been no need for a Redeemer to come. Verses 3 on state that the endless sacrifices never removed the people's sin in the eyes of God, and it left them with their guilt. You know, God never took pleasure in the sacrifices, and, and he would not accept it as a worthy sacrifice from the individual who was truly in a right relationship with him. Psalm 40, verses 6 says that Christ came to offer his body on the cross 
for which is the only sacrifice that is completely acceptable to God. The entire Old Testament was written about him and his coming. Now, Christ fulfilled the entire law and the prophecies about his coming. So the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus was made once for all and ended the law. It ended the law. The law, Mosaic law, is over. Jesus often pointed to the beginning, Genesis, the law of Moses, the first five books, and the prophets, as Jeremiah through Malachi, to reveal God's plan for mankind and clues to recognize the Savior when he appeared. For the Jews of his time, understanding the Old Testament was key to discover that Jesus is their promised Messiah. The entire Bible is inspired, and as such, all of it should be studied. The feasts are just a shadow of things that come, and they teach us in Bible typology, typology or models, if you will, of our Messiah. Just like we saw, Hebrews 1.10. Or 10-1, excuse me. <laughs> the feasts are a shadow of things to come, and they teach us again in Bible typology of our Messiah. Hebrews 10, verse 1. The feasts are prophetic types and examples of this foreshadowing concept about significant events in God's plan of redemption for mankind and on the earth as well. We see this also in 1 Corinthians 10. The feast can be thought of as a type of schoolmaster or a, or a tutor that leads us to the Messiah, Galatians 3.24. And they do point to the Messiah and God's plan for the world through the Messiah, Psalm 40, Hebrews 10. Jesus came to fulfill all the Old Testament laws. There are 613 of them. Uh, Nevi'im and Ketuvi'im are personified by the, by the Psalms. Nevi'im, Nevi'im and Ketuvi'im are parts of the Bible. The Torah is the third part of the Bible. So the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Nevi'im are the prophets, and Ketuvi'im are all the rest of the writings in the Old Testament. This is also personified by the Psalms. You know, the feasts represent a pattern of heavenly existence here on earth. We see this in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 9, Exodus 25, Numbers 8, Ezekiel 43, and other places. God provides the natural and practices to explain the spiritual. Let me say that again. He provides the natural, and he gives us specific practices to explain the spiritual. Now, in our last session, we looked at the vineyard, which is a natural concept to explain a spiritual concept of Israel's obedience. There is also a concept in the Bible called the appointed time, or, or a set season, if you will. When God gave these feasts, he said they were an appointed time. The Hebrew word is moed, moed, and it means appointed time. What this tells us is that God has set an exact time or a, an appointed time to fulfill the destiny of the earth in terms of its redemption and that of the heavenlies as well as the people in it. There's a total of seven of these festivals of the Lord. Passover, the first one, represents Israel's deliverance out of Egypt and the bondage that they experienced there. Unleavened bread presents the going out of Egypt. First fruits represents crossing of the Red Sea. Pentecost represents the giving of the law on uh, the mount. Rosh Hashanah is the blowing of the shofar to celebrate the Jewish New Year. Atonement, Yom Kippur, if you will, is the atonement when the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year, cleanse the, his sin, ask for forgiveness, and ask for forgiveness for the children of Israel. B'nai Yisrael. T 
tabernacles represents the entering the promised land with great rejoicing. Now I'm putting up a overhead here for you to see. Um, this will be in the notes that are available for anybody that wants them, and I'm sending them out on email too. You can see that Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits all happen in the month of Nisan. Pentecost, or the festival of weeks, happens in the month, the third month, Sivan. And you got trumpets uh, that happened right at the end of Elul, uh, the Day of Atonement in Tishri, and Tabernacles also in Tishri. Now I put Hanukkah down there, but that's not really a biblical holiday. So we're going to focus in on those that are in the Bible, the first seven in the Bible. And we go way, way back to Genesis. Let's look at what Genesis said here. Genesis 15, verses 13 to 14. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel, went from the land of Canaan to live in Egypt because there was a famine going on, and one of his sons, his 12 sons, Joseph, had already gone over there. He and his family, totaling 70 souls, went to Egypt in approximately... 1844 B.C. They would stay in Egypt for 400 years, and by the time was God was ready to have them leave and start the journey back to Canaan, they had grown to a population of around 2 million people. And we see these in uh, like Numbers 1 and 26 and Exodus 12 and so on. Moses was their leader, and he petitioned Pharaoh, Pharaoh to let him go. Pharaoh refused. So the Lord God sent ten plagues in succession unto Egypt to force Pharaoh to release them. The first nine had no effect upon, upon Pharaoh, but the tenth finally caused him to release the Hebrews. They fled the country along with many riches given by the Egyptians to send them off. And we see that in Exodus 12. Verses 35 to 36. The prophecy that God gave Abraham was unfolding exactly as it was given. It's this last plague, the death of the firstborn, that begins our discussion of the Passover. We see this in Exodus 11, verses 4 to 7. And Moses said, Thus the Lord about midnight will go into the midst of of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beast, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So God promised that he would not harm any of the Israelites. But in order for them to be protected, they had to follow a very strict, specific process during this tenth plague, in which all the firstborn animals and people are going to be put to death. Now, if the Jews followed the Lord's instructions explicitly, they'd be delivered from the death of all the firstborn that the others would experience. Now, let's look at the command here. Exodus 12, verses 21 to 28. Then, then, then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. That's the lamb. 
And he shall take a bunch of hyssop, that's a bunch of sticks in a particular plant, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye become to the land which the Lord will give you according as he had promised, you shall keep this service, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped, and the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. So, you know, the story goes on, and, and it continues to explain that the children of Israel were saved from the death of the destroyer when he would pass over their home. They were told to observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. They were also told that when your children shall ask you, what mean ye by this service? And she shall say, it's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. Now, this ritual is just rich with meaning for Christians, and it shows that Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, is the central figure in this ancient Jewish feast. You know, Christianity is actually a continuation and a fulfillment of God's plan for mankind that he gave the nation Israel. He elected the nation Israel who would bring forth the Messiah and the oracles of God. God, what he wanted us to know, came through, came through the Jews. When Christ appeared and started his ministry, the Jewish population flocked to him. All the early church believers were Jewish. Most of the Jewish leaders rejected him, not wanting to accept who he was because they feared losing their benefits um, and, and, and this charade that they had imposed on the people. They didn't know God. They didn't care about God. And they were leading these people and their power and their money uh, for their own benefit. They persuaded most of the people not to follow him, claiming their superiority as official leaders of the Jewish community. We see that in the fourth chapter of Acts in the second verse. They basically, they were saying, hey, look, if this guy was genuine, we would have endorsed him and we would have brought him. That was their uh, method of trying to turn people away from Jesus. But I can tell you, none of them denied his death and resurrection. None of them. So for approximately almost 2,000 years, uh, the non-Christian Jews have been trying to follow the Mosaic Law because they didn't believe that Jesus was their Messiah, even though Jesus is clearly the central figure in the law and the Passover, as we're going to see. Most Jews follow the ritual without ever realizing this because God told them that this was to be a perpetual celebration and they were to carefully explain it to their children. The Passover became the first of the seven festivals of the nation Israel. And it occurs, as I showed you in the card, I'm going to, chart, I'm going to put the chart back up here. On the tenth day of Nisan, when they singled out the lambs, and the fourteenth is the Passover. Their day started at sunset, and this festival also begins their religious calendar in the spring. So Passover is a key event in the history of Israel, 
And it becomes an underlying current throughout the entire Old Testament. It's interesting, you know, that by tradition, um, in, in Orthodox Hebrew culture, almost every major event in Israel is regarded to have occurred on the date that the Passover occurred. Or it seems to surface historically uh, significant, uh, you know, or have some historical significance to the Passover. Now, let's look at a few of these. The covenant with Abraham, we call this the Abrahamic covenant, where God promised him land, seed, blessings, and so on, is regarded to have occurred initially on the Passover. We see this in Genesis 15. Abraham is regarded as having entertained his heavenly guest by the oaks of Mamre on Passover. Sodom is regarded as being destroyed following Passover. Jericho is regarded as fallen on Passover. The handwriting on the wall in Daniel chapter 5 is regarded to have been happening on Passover. So the first scripture uh, in this event, which is a, a type of Passover, Genesis 3, if you will, where Adam and Eve clothed themselves with handmade fig leaves. God comes to them and said, where are you, Adam? Adam was the responsible individual. And he covers them with a coat of skins. This is the first shedding of innocent blood by God as a covering of their sins. You know, the Levitical system, Mosaic Law, if you will, can actually be traced to Genesis chapter 3. It gives us more insight into the story of Cain and Abel because the sacrifices were instituted in the Garden of Eden and they prophetically point to the Redeemer. Abel, by faith, observed the system, presented a blood sacrifice to God. Cain did not observe the system and presented what he wanted to offer, the fruits of his own hands, a non-blood sacrifice in contrast to Abel's offering. Cain never repented of this, ever. Abel did what God wanted. Perhaps the most dramatic prophecy of the trip of the Passover was in, was in Abraham, instructed by God, offered up Isaac in Genesis 22, called the Akedah. He was told, sacrifice your only son your only son that came from your body. Of course, uh, Ishmael was one of his sons as well. But they traveled three days, and they went up the hill known as Mount Moriah. And when where Isaac says, Father, where is where's the lamb for the offering? Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. And he did. He did. Well, obviously, Abraham didn't sacrifice his son. God tested Abraham's faith so that Abraham could see the strength of his faith. God knew what he was going to do. This is not a test for God. So Abraham is ready to sacrifice Isaac. He doesn't do it. But he makes this statement. God will provide himself a lamb. And he did there. About 2,000 years later, on a wooden cross at Calvary, he provided himself as a sacrifice to redeem us by his blood. Now, throughout these chapters, the word lamb never appears in the plural. It's always singular. And that's what makes it so personal, because our salvation is personal. You know, you can't say, well, my family got saved. Um, you know, our country got saved, our county, or whatever. No, this is all very, very personal. It's an individual salvation. We're not saved by somebody else's profession of faith. This is very, very personal. Now, I've asked people, are you willing to accept this? And that, you know, that makes it very personal when you do that. This feast isn't one of the Levitical feasts because it's so different from the others, but it's one of the festivals that they have each year. It's much more than that. The high priest slaughtered the lambs for the rabbinical feast. In contrast to this, 
The lamb for this festival is slaughtered by every household by the head of the household. It's also partaken and eaten personally by the entire family. So this is individual. These are individual families here uh, that partake of this festival. Let's look at a concept called the blood of the lamb from Exodus 12 verses 3 to 5. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. No, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You didn't note the sequence here. A lamb to the lamb to your lamb. Boy, this is really personal. A lamb to the lamb to your lamb. The definiteness there is very apparent. It's personal. Each person's redemption is only achieved by his own belief. Not by a minister or priest or a family member. It has to be done by each person in relationship with Christ to believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Every deal in the, every detail, excuse me, in the scriptures about the Passover point to Jesus. Leviticus twenty two, your lamb shall be without blemish. Psalm thirty four, keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And in Jesus' beating, none of his bones were broken. And when they broke the bones of the other men on the cross on either side of them, because that would then enable them to not be able to uh, stand up on the cross, because when they died, it was usually from asphyxiation, and they hung on the cross, and they would break their legs, and that would cause them to collapse, and they would die very soon after that. But Psalm 34 said, he said, he's keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. In Exodus 12:46, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So both speak of not breaking a bone of the Passover lamb. Jesus' bones were not broken. They hastened the death of these other two, but not Jesus. Passover represents the lamb slain before the foundation of the world for us. We essentially become covered by the blood once we accept the Lord into our lives. It's our decision, just as it was the ancient Israelites' decision to mark the doorpost and the lentil, the blood of the Lamb. Once we choose this and believe it and internalize it and take it in, we are justified, and God provides several actions that occur at right at the moment of belief here. We call this being born again, and you know the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John. He just couldn't understand it. How can I get born again? How can I, as an adult, go into my mother's womb and come back out again? The conversation was about the spiritual rebirth that must occur when belief, genuine belief happens. We're justified. We make peace with God. We receive the peace of God. We're sanctified, and we begin to grow more Christ-like, which lasts our whole lives. So that, that development over time, becoming more Christ-like, is like is the sanctification process. And once our bodies fail, we are then glorified. So we receive the Holy Spirit as an earnest deposit to be redeemed by God at either the rapture or the moment of our death, whichever happens first. We're endowed with spiritual gifts. Now, if the ancient Israelites chose not to accept God's atonement provision, the destroyer was going to kill the firstborn of that household. God did not do the destroying. It's important to note this, that he provided the way out. 
He provided the salvation. If we choose not to accept Christ upon death, we go straight to hell. There's no redemption after that for the unbeliever. Well, the heretics will tell you there is, but they have no scriptural basis for that. Look, Romans 15.4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Look what Amos 3.7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. Exodus twelve fourteen, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Note that the Lord instituted this for all times. This wasn't to end. The Jews still keep the Passover. Those that have accepted Christ do not slay the lamb, since the lamb was slain for all. Most of them still keep the feast, though, and they call it the Haggadah, or the Seder. Let's look at the seven festivals of Israel and move on here from the first one, because it's very, very interesting, and it's very edifying to understand these festivals and their relationship to the Jews at that time, what God wanted for them, and also how this gets fulfilled in the New Testament. The Lord's feasts are also called festivals, and they had a, a specific time for their yearly occurrence. And um, I'm going to put up the slide again with that circle that shows you where they are. For example, Passover, as we just said, represents Christ's sacrifice. Each feast spiritual prophetic significance has been fulfilled, except for the three that are in the fall. The first four have been fulfilled. The feast of Passover, we just discussed, was fulfilled with the death of Christ the Redeemer, but it clearly continues to the millennium as a ceremony. So the Messianic kingdom... This is going to go on as a ceremony. We see this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 1 Peter 1, 9. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is important to understand because it's being fulfilled in the holy walk of the believer with our Savior. The Feast of First Fruits was fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. The Feast of Pentecost was fulfilled in the establishment of the church at, at Pentecost, which was, that's the name of the festival, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Now let's look at the fall festivals. The Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled in the future, regathering of Israel at the beginning of the kingdom. The Day of Atonement will be fulfilled in its prophetic features, in its final uh, conversion of all Israel at the second coming. And the Feast of Tabernacles, or it's called Sukkot also, will finally be fulfilled in the millennium, or Messianic Kingdom, specifically. This one's mentioned in Zechariah in 14.6. So three of these seven festivals of Israel occur in the month of Nisan, First three deal with Christ's first coming, and Passover became the first of the seven festivals. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for seven days, starts on the 14th of Nisan, the end of the Passover. In 1 Corinthians 5, leaven, unleavened bread, if you will, is shown to be, a in Bible topology, an example of sin. So leaven causes puffing up of dough and bread. It's, it's used as a symbol of sin. The first fruits represents the resurrection, and it's the day following the Sabbath of the Passover. Now, Jesus died on the Passover. Unleavened bread starts on the day right after Passover, where sin is put away. 
sin is put away, it's buried, and first fruits, the resurrections on the first day of the week or the day after the Sabbath. The middle one, Pentecost, is 50 days after first fruits and represents a church age, and since the church was born on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So these three main fall festivals are trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. They represent Christ's second coming. So the only two feasts uh, really explicitly listed in the Bible passages occurring in the millennium are the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot, and the Feast of Passover, including the use of unleavened bread. Sukkot is the only real agrarian feast of the seven, which is going to be carried out in the millennium. When all the righteous from heaven and the earth are ingathered to live in peace and harmony for a thousand years, and all will enjoy God's grace and protection. Passover celebrates this national cleansing, and it points back to Christ's death, and it will be celebrated as a celebration of Jesus' work for us. Now, this clearly continues the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, if you will, will finally be fulfilled by Israel's new position in God in the Millennial Kingdom. All the others will have been prophetically fulfilled, and they don't need to be completed. There's some speculation as to why, whether all seven will be carried out in the Millennial Kingdom or not, but it doesn't matter because they're fulfilled and then possibly celebrated. We know that tabernacles and the Passover will be celebrated then for sure. Because of our ancestors, Adam and Eve's sin, that sin had a chance to enter the original perfect world. Now We're now born into a sinful world, and no matter what we do growing up, there isn't a thing we can do to get the sin out of us. We may be able to convince other humans we're squeaky clean, but not God. He knows our born-in-sin nature completely. So as we clean out our homes of the yeast, and that's what, that's what is done here for unleavened bread. The homes are cleaned out of the yeast, and the Jews will eat matzo, a yeastless bread that has no... It's flat bread. And we're reminded that the sin that we have is something we can do anything about. It's a hopeless case, just like our inability to clean out the junk in our souls and our spirits. We need someone perfect to do it for us. Matzo is an interesting bread. It's like a cracker, and it has stripes that look like bruises, and it's pierced through with holes. The rabbi's reason for using this is to make the bread cook faster from start to finish, and I think it takes about 18 minutes. That's supposedly the amount of time it takes to prepare and cook in a manner that will keep all yeast out. But what they don't seem to realize is, the unsaved Jews now, they've created the perfect symbolum symbolism, if you will, that God initiated long, long ago. Belief on the Lord Jesus frees us from the bondage of sin and eternal punishment. He removes the leaven, the sin, from our life. Jesus was beaten and bruised and pierced for our sins. He was and is the only sinless person on this planet. And his body is represented by the matzo. Even in modern-day Judaism, they can't get away from God's plan of redemption. <laughs> we need Jesus' atoning blood to cleanse us of those sins. We have to let him come in to live inside of us in the form of the Holy Spirit, where he can slowly find all that yeast and burn it up in us. That's a sanctification process. We grow more Christ-like as we turn from our sins, he burns up the sin, just like the families burn up the leftover yeast before these two feasts. We need God to live a yeastless lifestyle. But even then, it's going to be a daily process, you know, because yeast and sin, if you will, permeates the entire world. We're constantly being 
uh, tempted by it. This feast is the perfect celebration of our Savior whose body was broken for our sins. Come, celebrate with me. We, we have had our communion, and I want you to believe that these things are important and just enjoy what God has done for us. Now, the Feast of Trumpets, if you will, is the fifth feast, and it's one on the, in the fall. Uh, we see this in Leviticus 23, 24. It's a, it's a beautiful declaration of God's command to his people to rest. During uh, a time of regular work is prohibited. Men and women present a food offering to God. And in that passage, God commands the people to gather and to commemorate the decree with trumpet blast. On the same front, the sound of the trumpet is also associated with the rapture or the time Jesus is going to come for his bride. 1 Corinthians 15.52 Once he returns, there will be a wedding feast of celebration. And Revelation 19.19 19 says, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the land. He's preparing us to celebrate. Then the Day of Atonement, uh, also known as Yom Kippur from Leviticus 16 uh, and, and Leviticus 23, says to make atonement is to make restitution for wrongs committed. And it's a day, it's a day of humility and, and repentance to God. And it was a time for the Jews to get their hearts, consciousnesses, and, and lives right before him. The observant uh, involved the sacrifice of animals as the high priest entered the Holy Holies. What the high priest did there couldn't offer an annual payment for their sins. However, hiding in plain sight was the promise of one who could atone for their sins permanently. So the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and he tried to make atonement for those sins he confessed the sins of his himself. He confessed the sins of the nation Israel. But in now, it is Jesus, our high priest, who has done this for us. Where is Jesus in these sacrificed animals? The bull and one of the goats was offered for thanks. But it is this concept of the scapegoat that took on their sins. We see this in Leviticus 16.10. This goat was given the sins of Israel. They would put their hands on this goat, and they would, uh, in its imagery or model, if you will, give this goat the sins, and the goat then would run off into the wilderness, taking away their sins. The Jewish leaders condemned Jesus, and he was burdened with the sins of all mankind. He was led out of the city to be crucified like the scapegoat. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the world. We see that in 1 John 2.2. 2. The necessity of the Day of Atonement was rendered void by Jesus' death on the cross. The debt has been paid. But from a prophetic view, there's going to be um, this nation Israel. It's a time when they will finally confess their sin of unbelief in the Messiah. And that ends the tribulation. The last festival is the Feast of Tabernacles, or, or booths, if you will. And uh, that one always follows the Day of Atonement. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrates God's provision and protection for the people of Israel during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness in a couple of different ways. Uh, for the seven days of the feast, the people live in these temporary structures now. Just like they did in the wilderness, the, the Lord himself was with the Israelites in the desert in a tented temple called the tabernacle. So the feast also celebrates his presence 
as he tabernacles or dwells with us. Jesus is called Emmanuel. God is with us. He puts on a temporary tabernacle, the human body, for him to dwell on this earth and offers himself as a sacrifice. Now, this feast also points to the promise that God will return and rally with his people in the person of Jesus. And when he does, he has the promise that there will be no more death, no more suffering, and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. The return, his return, is the final answer to the hope we've carried our entire lives. What a day that will be. Prophetically, it looks to the Messianic kingdom where Israel will be protected from the wiles of the devil because the devil will be bound for a thousand years. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, or it's also known as Booths, will be continued on in the Millennial Kingdom. And we see this in Zechariah 14, 16, where the text reads, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, along with all the Jews, the Gentile nations are going to be coming up to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths. Today they also call it Sukkot. Uh, according to the Old Testament law, the ancient Israelites were required to appear before the Lord three times in the year, Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And in this verse, uh, verse here, it's, it, it's during the Millennial Kingdom. The Gentiles, too, are going to have to present themselves once a year to pay annual homage to the King of the Earth. For Jesus is going to be on the throne in the Holy of Holies, in the temple in Jerusalem, running the world. For the ancient Jews, this feast commemorated the gathering into the harvest, and it also represents divine protection. And, and so therefore, it's, like a, it's a fitting symbol of their entrance into the Messianic kingdom. You know, today in modern Israel, the feast, the, the, this feast is still kept. The Jewish tabernacle, and later the temple, was the center of life for Israel. And it was the essence of God's protection for the ancient Israelites. Let's look at uh, Leviticus 23, verses 33 to 44. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, is the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Jehovah. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work. These are the set feasts of Jehovah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto Jehovah, burn offering and a meal offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, each on its own day. Besides the Sabbath of Jehovah, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings, which ye shall give unto Jehovah. Howbeit, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruits of the land, ye shall keep the feast of Jehovah seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And ye shall take you on the first day the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and, and ye shall rejoice before Jehovah your God seven days. And ye shall keep a, at a feast unto Jehovah seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths, 
in booths you shall dwell, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Jehovah your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the set feast of Jehovah. So a, um, a sukkah is what kind of what it's called today. It's a temporary dwelling built during the Jewish feast, the tabernacles. Uh, Sukkot <laughs> uh, is the plural form of the Hebrew word, uh, Hebrew word sukkah, which means a temporary dwelling place. The sukkah is also said to, re, to, to, to represent the temporary ch- shelters that um, the Jews lived in while they were wandering in the desert for 40 years. It also refers to the huts near the edges of their fields during the harvest season. These dwellings not only provide shade, but also give uh, a lot of time for the workers to rest after their work in the field. It usually has at least two and a half sides. It can be constructed of any material, so long as they're secure and they can't flap in the wind. And they make it all out of all kinds of different material. And the sukkah is often decorated with uh, autumn fruits, vegetables, and so on. Many people get very creative with these today. The Feast of Tabernacles, though, had characteristics that the other feasts did not. For example, it was the Feast of In-Gathering. It represents, it represents the Millennial Kingdom. The Old Testament has many hidden truths. In light of the New Testament being a richer understanding of our life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, Shall we pray? Father, we are so blessed that you teach us, Lord, that you give us this information, that you give us these truths, to let us draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, and more and more greatly appreciate what he's done for us. Thank you, Father, for blessing us so richly. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, shall we sing our next tune, which is, It Is Well With My Soul. And we'll take our offering for those of you that are um, so led. Uh, God bless you.
Well, shall we sing our uh, second tune? It's uh, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, uh, Gary, uh, would you be able to uh, lead us in prayer here as we close? Heavenly Father, we come to you this day of trial and tribulation going on before us. We thank you for safety and security that you've provided all of us during this time. Lord, thank you for your word in Psalm 91, where your word comforts us. And it tells us that, quote, we shall not, we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, that you are our refuge and fortress, and you will trust. And you've told us, Lord, that you will deliver us from the perilous pestilence. In times such as this that we're going through, Lord, we should take refuge under, under your wings. Take fear from us, Lord. It's prevalent around the world, in our country, and some even times in our homes. And in verse 10 and 11 of Psalm 91, you have told us, quote, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Thanks for your word, Lord. I'm grateful that we have it through all of the errors of people trying to destroy it, and yet you have caused it to survive, and I'm just grateful for that, Lord. I'm grateful for its truths, especially for you loving us. And today we're reminded of your love, this special Easter that we set aside to remember what you did for us, and that you sent your son as a babe in swaddling clothes that first Christmas. Many people remember Christmas, they observe Christmas, but to forget about the reason that you came, Lord, to die for all our sins on that first Good Friday. But what changed this whole world, Lord, is that three days later, you rose from the grave, victorious over death on that first Easter Sunday. As we observe Easter this day, as we go forward this week, 
that you have provided us. I pray that all who are listening have asked you to be their Lord and Savior and have put their trust in you. There's no safer place on earth, Lord. Watch over and protect us as your word teaches us. Look for our country during this perilous time, Lord, for our world. Pray for our president and our leaders that they bend their knee to you for guidance and wisdom, but especially that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done and are going to do for us. And I give special thanks, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Gary. Oh, that concludes our service for today. God bless you. You were listening while in Egypt to our cries of mercy pleading. You were with us in the through the time of wanting, needing You were making us your people Ones who follow where you're leading You were teaching in the fire Giving us our heart's desires May all the people praise you Sing and dance before you Make a joyful noise unto the Lord King of all the kingdom Creator of creation Author of salvation On his throne in heaven we are called to be your people for eternity, your nation. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We give thanks to God in heaven, His love that is everlasting. We give praise to you, Jehovah, for your mercy's never ending. You have made us now your people. Brought us back from all the nations You were teaching us in exile How to love you undefiled May all the people praise you Sing and dance before you Make a joyful noise unto the Lord King of all the kingdom Creator of creation Author of salvation On his throne in heaven We are called to be your people For eternity Make a joyful noise unto the Lord May all the people praise you Sing and dance before you Make a joyful noise unto the Lord King of all the kingdom Creator of creation Author of salvation On your throne in heaven We are called to be your people For 